Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, this is Steve coming to you from the comfort of my office over here in room 106 at the, uh, the main building. Um, what I'm going to talk to you about today, let's see if I get this webcam uh, in focus here a little bit, is uh, Chapter 7, because we are kind of running short on time due to me being out of town on Monday, and uh, we had snow day a couple weeks ago, and it kind of pushed everything back a little bit. So I'm going to cover Chapter 7 in a video. And so I'm going to explain to you in class today, it's Monday, uh, that you need to go watch this video on Chapter 7 and Chapter 8, and we'll discuss them uh, uh, very briefly next Monday, and then you can take the test on Monday uh, before Wednesday's class, like we did last time. So that's, that's kind of what we're going to do a little bit here. So this is Chapter 7, Innovation and Change. And as I go through it, hopefully it'll make some sense to you, and I'll give you a lecture on it. Um, technology cycle. One thing, it's important for companies to be innovative and to change. Uh, no company can survive if it just refuses to change. We've seen examples like this repeatedly with companies like Blockbuster, um, Kmart, Sears, uh, some of these different kind of companies that have slowly died like a, a slow death by paper cuts because they just didn't change, they weren't very innovative, they didn't stay up to date, um, and it's been kind of sad. So. The first thing that causes change is what we call technological cycles, or technology cycles. Because most businesses today are driven by, very much so by technology, uh, and the changes in technology. And so, technology cycle begins with the birth of a new technology, and it ends when that technology reaches its limit and it dies. Okay, um, and we've seen this, this cycle play out over and over and over. And the first one I'm going to talk about will be um, the VCR video cassette recorder that uh, you, many of us grew had we grew up with as children and the videotapes and all that kind of stuff okay so this next chart shows the s curves of the technological innovation cycle so let's think back uh, many of you are too young but back in the day when the vhs first came on the scene and this would have been the early 1990s okay and in the early 1990s or late 1980s there were two basic platforms Sony had this, this thing called Betamax, and it was a little bit thicker, higher, uh, kind of a cartridge tape. It was, a, it was kind of a VHS tape, um, and it had, you had to buy a special Betamax player for it. And then there was the VHS tape, the VHS format. And for a while, they were both alive, and they both, Sony was trying to make the Betamax go, and the v, VHS people were trying to make the VHS tape go. Well, eventually the VHS won. I mean, and so Betamax, Sony gave up, they discontinued making Betamax and all that kind of stuff, and everyone adapted to the VCRs. It's, people started running out and buying VCRs and renting VHS tapes, because movies were suddenly available on VHS tapes, and we weren't, didn't no longer have to go to the cinemas and drive-ins. And this kind of precipitated, uh, or was a cause for the death of drive-ins. Because used to what happened whenever I was a kid, is movies would come out at the cinema, and then as they got older, you, the cinemas would, of course, always have newer movies, but what would happen is that you'd be able to watch, go watch movies that would come up at drive-ins, and these were the movies after they'd been out a long time. Well, now, suddenly, we were still going to the, the cinemas to see new movies, but then as movies went out of the cinema, they showed up as VHS tapes, and video stores popped up, and hence the death of drive-ins. Okay? So... Now we're in the era of VHS tapes, and we all own VCRs, and we all record our shows, and we go and we rent movies, and we watch them on the VCRs, okay? Well, that's where we see the A and the B, the first curve here. VCRs, and, and remember this time, VCRs were $350, $400 for a good VCR, um, because the technology was new, it was expensive, there wasn't much to compete with it, and we were willing to pay for it, because of the money we would save and have to go to the movies and stuff, uh, and people wanted it. So we ran out, we bought these VCRs. And so that's where we see this S-curve going up. As VCR was great, the sales were great, it was really leading technology, it rode that curve all the way up. And for many years it was dominant, and we saw the, the emergence of mom and pop video stores, Blockbuster became king, right? Uh, they had this really dominant market product, uh, these video stores, huge video stores with a big selection. You could go and you could rent movies, keep them for three days, you know, and it was a wonderful thing. They were sitting fat and happy. And then we saw DVDs start becoming, and that they came after the invention of the CD player. Well, then we started taking it into video, digital video, and we started seeing DVDs come. So that caused discontinuity. Suddenly there was a new, new sheriff in town. 
there was this new product, and it was stealing the thunder of the VCR. And so then we saw, for a while, Blockbuster and these video stores had both VHS tapes and the DVD side by side. Okay, But as the DVD gained in popularity and we saw its curve start going up, we saw the VCR plateau and start diving back down. Right, And then for a while we even had, you could go and you could buy D VHS players that had the tape and the DVD player in the same unit. That way you had choices, right? Okay, well now we don't even see that much anymore. DVD has kind of taken over. We've seen the VCR kind of die out. Most people have gotten rid of their VCRs, uh, the video cassette recorders and the players, and we've gotten rid of the tapes, and now we're a DVD world. People have big DVD collections, right? And so it's writing that technology up. And even in the beginning of the, of the DVDs, we saw the emergence of high def. And for a while, we had DVD HD, which is a high definition DVD, and we had Blu ray. And the same thing happened. Blu ray won out, the DVD HD format was discontinued, and then Blu ray took over. However, Blu-ray's got a short shelf life. It's, got a, it's not going to be around for very long because now it's being displaced by new technology again. Um, we're not running out and running DVDs much longer because we're starting to get things like Amazon On Demand, Vudu On Demand, Hulu Plus on our televisions, Netflix on our TVs. We don't even have to run to the video store anymore. So we see this kind of S-wave go over and over and over with different technologies. Okay. Um, we can also apply the same kind of thing to the MP3 player. Remember when MP3 players first came out and people ran out and they had to have an iPod. I gotta have an iPod. They ran out and they bought, well, there'd be an iPod or a Sansa or all these little devices where we could load MP3s onto, right? And, and iPod was huge and it re revitalized Apple. Well, now we're not even buying MP3 players. Why? Because it's convergence. They're, they're, they're on our phones, right? It's built in. So a lot of people aren't even buying the iPod Touches and things anymore. Again, iPod was hot for a while, made a lot of money on it. Oh, it's, been, it's been replaced again. So this is a continuous thing that we see going over time. And that's what this next diagram shows you, is this is a repeating theme in our life. Um, and same thing, with the, you can apply this kind of diagram to anything. Look at televisions, look at computers, look at uh, telephones. Uh, almost any kind of technology, you can see that play out over and over and over. So the emergence of this dominant design, there's always winners and losers. Um, some can say that, well, the VCR really wasn't a loser because the same people made the DVD players. So all they did was switch technology. But you can't say that about the people who own video stores, right? Because now we see video stores are, are dying out because we can get this stuff at home. So I see you see Mr. Movies and Blockbusters and all these places kind of closing their doors. Um, so the emergence of this dominant design signals a shift from design and experimentation and competition to incremental change. And what that means is, okay, the, the iPhone, for example, the iPhone 5, this is a dominant design. But they're not reinventing it any longer. Remember the iPhone 4, the iPhone 3? Incremental change now. They came out with a good product. It's pretty dominant. They're not going to reinvent the wheel. They are just going to change this incrementally. So we see, well, now they're adding a retina display screen, and uh, now it's got a video camera on both sides. You know, so they just keep tweaking it and adding little things um, to keep the comp to hold the competition off and to keep advancing their product. But it's a good product. Okay. Um, managing innovation. How do we manage innovation? Some companies manage innovation by trying to create a great atmosphere and, and hiring bright people with a lot of ideas and things like that. Um, during discontinuous change, companies must find a way to anticipate and survive these technological changes. They got to try to stay ahead of the curve, and we saw that curve. They got to kind of keep anticipating what's next and be prepared for it, and always be watching what's coming on the on the horizon uh, with the with these companies. So they got to be constantly what we call scanning their environment, being aware of the new competitors in town and what's happening, and and what's changing. They have to manage also that incremental change in innovation. They want to keep their current product alive, but they also have to be watching in their rearview mirror for what's coming up behind them. Okay, so they've got to be doing both these things at the same time. Now, how do we create creative work environments? Um, you've heard stories about Google 
having pool tables and ping pong tables and bean bag chairs, um, different companies like that that are young and cutting edge and not having standard work hours because they know that not everyone can, you know, has all their best ideas between the hours of eight and five. So they allow people to come in. If you're a late sleeper and you're not don't really wake up till ten, you come in. You work from ten till seven if you want. You know, um, so they they try to create be flexible. They try to create a stimulating environment, a lot of artwork, pictures, music, leisure activities, um, things like that. So the organizational has to encourage it. They have to create an environment that is encouraging to creative ideas. Um, the supervisors also have to encourage it. They can't be all fire and brimstone. You need to get to work. You know, they need to provide them with this opportunity to think um, and encourage them to come up with new ideas and bounce them off people and not be afraid of. Of uh, well, the supervisors have to encourage it, not be poo-poo on it kind of deal. They also have work have to work group encouragement, and that would be making sure that you you have creative people, creative minds, people who are positive, optimistic, um, not naysayers and uh, pessimists. Okay, so that would be a work group encouragement kind of thing. And then lastly, you got to give them the freedom. Not lastly, but one of the biggest things is you have to give them the freedom to think. Um, for example. Google sets aside a certain amount of time every day that you can just sit and daydream. They never will, you know, kind of get on anyone if they're just sitting there kind of leaning back and looking at the ceiling or, you know, playing, you know, uh, paper wad basketball or anything like that. As long as they're creative, they, they give them that freedom to think and maybe that's, maybe that's what they do to get their creative juices flowing. Who knows? Um, they have to take away all impediments, meaning that they can't, shoot down a, an idea or say that, that's a terrible idea or that's a stupid idea because when you do that you stifle that creativity they have to be willing to say that there is no such thing as a bad idea just some ideas are better than others okay but welcome all ideas you never know who's going to come up with the next big huge blockbuster idea so don't shoot anybody down and create that good environment and then lastly the work has to be challenging enough to stimulate thought Boring, mundane, repetitive work stimulates nothing. So the work has to be somewhat challenging. So when you get in these dynamic environments, like a Google, like a Yahoo, uh, like a Zappos, for example, or Amazon, certainly, um, always thinking outside the box, welcome creativity. You never know who's going to be able to solve your next problem, come up with a new idea. So it has to be that kind of a place. And uh, in the news right now, one of, one of the students, uh, one of the students in your class, uh, Ms. Gillum, also shared with me uh, something I had just read about Yahoo is going through this process. Yahoo has always been this company that, if you were, uh, uh, many of you might remember when you were younger, Yahoo was the search engine. They were the original search engine um, that was kind of a blockbuster search engine. Uh, before that, we had things like Lycos and uh, uh, Buku.com and Dogpile.com. Uh, uh, Excite uh, were, were kind of these search engines. There were a lot of them. They were small, minor players, and all they were were search engines. Yahoo came on the scene and was a search engine, and they had a great ad campaign, Yahoo, you know, the guy yodeling. And they took their search engine, but not only was it a search engine, but they also turned it into what we, we would call an internet portal, where you could go to their Yahoo page, and there were all kinds of news stories. You can customize the page, and many people have Yahoo set as their home page, um, such as me, older people like me who are kind of became accustomed to Yahoo and you can tailor it to show you news stories that you want to see it's a it has they provided email which the other ones didn't before so they were kind of cutting edge where they were one of the first ones to provide email accounts to people so many people have a Yahoo email account um, they have calendar function my wife and I share a Yahoo calendar there's, so there's a lot of functionality there and they're not just a search engine any longer and they were doing really well for a while um, sitting on top well a new company came along that was a little bit more innovative, a little younger, um, a little bit different style of doing business, and it was called Google. And Google became such a popular and powerful search engine that it became a verb. We no longer search for things on the internet, we Google them. Uh, so think of how powerful that is when they became a household name. So now we look at um, what, they're, what they're doing to Yahoo is really killing Yahoo. Uh, because they have kind of taken over the search engine function. Now they also have Gmail, um, which is you know another email. They have Google Calendars, and they've even went farther. They have Google Docs. They are expanding, and they're becoming even more powerful. And it's killing Yahoo. Uh, it's kind of putting them, uh, making people move away from them. 
And there's other things in Google. I have Google Chrome, they have their own browser. You know, they're just a, they've really grown as a company. Um, they're very creative, very innovative, and they are outmaneuvering Yahoo. So the new CEO of Yahoo is changing things. She has to. She has to try to make her company competitive again. And she's taken some time to get to know the company and look at the problems of the company. And one of the first things, major things she's doing to institute some change is she's doing away with telecommuting or people working out of their homes. And she's making them all come to the office so she can get a better idea of what they do, how productive they are, and things like that. And so she can start addressing some of these issues and try to get Yahoo back on the right track. Okay, so that's just an example of a company. Now, to manage change, some companies use what's called the experiential approach. It assumes that innovation is occurring within a highly uncertain environment, much like Yahoo. And the key to fast, productive innovation is to, innovation is to use innovation, flexible options, and hands-on experience. Uh, some companies do this by, uh, with engineers coming up with new designs, bouncing things off, making prototypes, testing the prototypes, what do people think of it, Let, give, letting them give suggestions, setting milestones uh, along the way to try to lead people kind of with breadcrumbs into changing products and, and things like that, or developing multifunctional teams to look at different aspects. Um, RIM might be a company that, um, well, I, I would think this would be more of a company like Microsoft would use the experiential approach uh, because they have an existing product that is very, very good. Uh, Microsoft Office is the best Office suite software in the world. They have the obviously the best um, or the most largest market share of operating system. So they're not going to go reinvent this stuff. What they're going to do is constantly make prototypes of new stuff. They're going to test it out. They're going to get input, things like that. They'll use multifunctional teams. What they want to do with their product is just keep it cutting edge, keep put adding new things into it to keep people wanting to purchase the newest version of it. The word processor is always going to be a word processor. It's going to function very similar. Excel spreadsheet. It's always going to be a, a spreadsheet software. They're just going to keep tweaking it and adding bells and whistles and looking at the old design versus the new design and what and testing it and things like that. So Microsoft would be a company that uses the experiential approach. The next one would be the compression approach. These are companies that are typically trying to catch up with someone who already has a dominant design. For example, Research in Motion was the company that made Blackberries. And they were sitting on top of the world for a while. Everyone using Blackberries, they were called Crackberries. I have to pause for a second. I'll come right back to this. Okay, Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. Hey, uh, so Research in Motion. Crackberries. Everyone had a Crackberry, right? And they thought they were doing great. They, you know, they had such a big following. They had a huge market share. And then the iPhone came along, and uh, Apple made it so that only AT&T had the iPhone. So really, for a while, didn't hurt Blackberries. Research in motion, and they were still sitting there, kind of fat and happy, and um, still was doing really well. Well. Then once that AT&T contract expired and suddenly everyone could sell Verizon and everyone could sell iPhones and you could get iPhone for everybody, BlackBerry kind of crumbled and lost a lot of business. And now, now they have to use a compression approach. They have to do something. Um, so they have to have generational change. They already have a product. They already have some technology. But they have to adapt that technology and change it because iPhone has now become the dominant design. And everyone's rushing to get that design. So we've seen Samsung come out, HTC come out, LG come out, all these touchscreen phones, Blackberries behind the eight ball. So now they have to do some generational change. They have to take their existing technology, they have to get their suppliers involved in order to provide them with touchscreens. They have to come up with something that will compete with this dominant design so they can have a piece of that market. They had to shorten the time of the individual steps and they had to overlap some things to try to rush something to market so before they backslid too far and became a non-player. And we see this, uh, the, the, the cell phone market is very cutthroat. And we see this happening repeatedly with these companies. They're trying to copy each other's designs. Uh, for example, at, in, for Samsung, what they've done basically uh, has been sued by Apple because they totally copied what Apple is saying is the iPhone design, a lot of their technology, um, which is not good. So these companies have to catch up, but, but not totally just create a new iPhone, uh, copy the exact design of the iPhone. And they use the compression approach for that very often. Okay. So, okay, so next thing they need to look at 
is going to be the risk of not changing. And we all see what the risk of not changing is. The risk of not changing is that you die. Your company goes under. We've seen it happen with Kmart. We've seen it happen with Blockbuster. Uh, companies like that all the time. Okay. So I'm going to use Blockbuster, the perfect example for this. The risk of not changing is that the organization decline occurs when the companies don't anticipate, recognize, neutralize, or adapt the internal and external pressures that threaten their survival. And this is why Yahoo, this lady, is making these people change the way they do things uh, because she doesn't want to go bankrupt. They, they, they're losing money now. Um, they're backsliding. Google has become dominant. They have to do something to be able to, to compete or die. Um, so let's look at Blockbuster. First of all was the blinded stage. Blockbuster was fat and happy, doing business. Everyone was going to Blockbuster. They were putting mom and pops out of business. Um, their competition was going away because they were crushing them and they were this big behemoth making money hand over fist. Then they were blindsided. They weren't watching. They, they, they were adapting to this DVD change. No problem. We'll just take, move the VCR tapes out while we move the DVDs in. We're ready for this. No sweat. But what they weren't watching was what a company called Netflix was doing with DVDs. The, the sudden ability to set up, instead of opening up all these brick and mortar stores all over the place, make a central depository where they have all the VHS tapes and just mail them out. Be a much more economical model. Okay, they were blindsided by this. They weren't paying attention. They weren't scanning their environment. And suddenly this thing came to market. People jumped all over it because they could sign up for $8 a month uh, for, for one tape or up to $12 to $15 a month and be able to have three movies at a time. No late fees. You can keep them as long as you want. It. They, you put them in an envelope. They'd give you the envelope. Posted is free. You'd mail them back. They'd mail you another one. Under, you could set up a playlist or a, a re reservation list, and they would send you the movies in order as you returned the old ones. It was a sweet deal. You never had to go in and worry about them being out. If they were out, uh, they would immediately, uh, very often, they would send you a free movie, to the next movie down to replace it, and as soon as your movie came in, they'd send it to you. Great, great model. They were blinded by this. Well, and then they moved into the next stage, inaction. They didn't have any way of competing with that. They didn't have a central location where all their movies were because their movies were all spread out all over the place in all these brick and mortar freestanding stores. So they couldn't easily compete. So what they did was inaction. They did nothing. Let's see what happens. Surely it won't hurt us that bad. And it slowly did. So that was bad. So that didn't work. So the next thing they did was they did what was called the faulty action stage. In order to try to compete with Blockbuster, I mean with Netflix, they decided, okay, well, guess what? We're going to do away with late fees also. That way our customers will come back. Because one of the sweet things was late fees, no late fees. And you can check out, you know, as many movies you want and keep them no late, no late fees. Well, that didn't work because what happened is people went to Blockbuster, got movies, and then kept them. Never took them back, no late fees. So then new customers coming into Blockbuster, there was nothing on the shelves, you know, except the movies no one wanted to see. All the good movies were, were out. And you go up to the front desk, when's that coming back? Well, we have no idea, right? So how, long, how many times are you going to keep driving back to Blockbuster to, to look for a movie that's not there? So that did not work. Um, so that was a faulty action stage. So then what they did is they sent letters. They had to go to the expense of sending letters to all the customers that had movies and tell them to bring them back because in 30 days, we will start incurring late fees again. They had to put a date out there, you know, and if you don't bring it back by the 30th of this month, then from that point on, you're going to start getting late fees. And so that cost them money to mail it. There was a lag period of time. They are waiting for all the movies to come back to get on the shelves again, right? By this time, Netflix was kicking their ass. And that moved them into crisis stage. And crisis stage was Blockbuster then tried to set up something to compete with Netflix, where they could mail out DVDs to you, and you could take them back to any store you wanted to. By this time, too damn late, right? Netflix had been entrenched. People had already jumped ship. They had subscriptions to Netflix. It was really hard to get those customers back. And now we've seen that they are in the dissolution stage. Uh, the Iowa City store is, is going out of business. I think it's already shut down. I think last week was the last week it was in business. And you're seeing this happen to blockbusters all over the United States. And what will probably happen is that they'll sell their, their, their library of videos and DVDs to Netflix and give up. Uh, they'll, they'll throw in the towel and call it quits. So, now, change forces. Change forces. Um, 
Change forces lead to differences in the form, quality, or condition of an organization over time. Typically what happens is there has to be a reason to, for change. For example, Yahoo, if they don't change, they will slowly go out of business. It will be a slow, long death by paper cuts as Google just kicks their ass. So they have to change. So what they've done is they've replaced, replaced the CEO. They had a, you know, a CEO doing business the same old way for years. They've got rid of the CEO, the head of the company. They brought in a new CEO. This lady has brought in some of her people. She's taken some time to get to know the company and look and identify what the problems are. And now she's going to initiate some changes. And there's going to be resistance. And that's what the resistance forces are. And resistance is caused by self-interest, misunderstanding, and distrust. So let's look at this real quick. The resistance to change, self-interest. I've always done it this way. I'm comfortable with this way. I don't want to change. I'll, that means, you know, and one of the things she's doing is getting rid of telecommuting, as I said. So now these people are going to no longer be allowed to work out of their home. They have to come into the office so that she can get to know them, see what they do, see how productive they are, and so forth. They don't want that. I've always been good sitting at home. I, my kids are at home. I can, you know, run errands in my free time. I can work around my own schedule, right? It's all about them. That's one resistance. Misunderstanding and distrust. They're not sure why they have to go in. They've always been doing it this way. Why do we have to go in and work in an office all of a sudden? I don't trust this lady. Okay? And general intolerance for change. I'm not going to change. I've been doing it this way since, you know, since I started at Yahoo. I'm not changing. Okay? One second. Okay, so resistance to change. We've talked about that. General intolerance for change. You know, people uh, don't want to change. We all, we all resist change. No one likes change, basically because we're afraid. We get comfortable setting our ways. We are afraid of change because um, it's so unknown. It's, uh, so people just actually just resist it. And there are a lot of people who um, just refuse to change. And so how do you handle that? So that's going to be the next thing we look at. So how do we uh, make people change? Well, we have to unfreeze them in their ways. And to un that's the first part of it, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we have to do change, what, what's called uh, change intervention, and then we refreeze them into the new way of doing things. So unfreezing is getting people affected by change to believe that the change is needed. And for this, they have to do a lot of communication. And for, let's say, for example, the lady at Yahoo right now, and I, I'm sorry that I, her name escapes me, because I, I read the article yesterday again, and I, I can't remember her name. Um, but she has to tell people, explain to them why we need to change because we are losing money. We are starting to, you know, if we continue in this model, the way of doing things, we will not, you won't have a job very long because we will go out of business. That's a pretty good motivator for most people to make them think, well, okay, all right, fine. I want to, you know, I've been working here a long time. I want this company to be successful. So that's a good way of unfreezing them. It's just being, you know, transparent about your reasons for the change and why you have to do it. Uh, and then doing change intervention itself, where workers and managers change their behavior and their work practices. This is going to require training managers on the new way of doing things, having sit-down sessions with people to talk about the problems and issues and what they're uncomfortable with and working all through it. That's change intervention. And it's not a quick overnight thing. It's going to be a process. And then refreeze them on the new way of doing things, meaning not let them go back to their old ways, making sure you keep reinforcing that we need to do things this way because we, you know, we, we're, keep your eye on the prize, we, we have to change, we have to become competitive again, we have to become innovative, we have to come up with new ideas, and just refreeze them and not let them go back to the old way of doing things. And companies have to go through this uh, every so often in order to keep up and keep pace. So managing it. Make sure you educate your employees. Again, be transparent. Let, let them know why it's important that you value them as an employee if it, and you want to be able to stay in business and provide them with this, with this job and this, these benefits and so forth. Uh, communicate all the information that's necessary. Ha let them be a participant in the planning and implementing of the new processes and the, and the change itself. Let them discuss and agree on who will do what after the change so they have some input. And then the last thing you want to do to manage resistance to change is to do coercion. Uh, but sometimes it gets to that point where it becomes either you do it this way or we're going to let you go because we're moving on. We're moving this direction and you're trying to stay over here. And, you know, if you're not going to do it the way we need it for you to be uh, to help us and to do this, and we're going to let you go and find someone who will. 
but you know, hopefully that's always the last resort. You just don't go in and just threaten people right away. That that may make them change, but they're not going to be very willing to change. They're not going to they're not going to make it an easy process. Now, the mistake that managers make uh, in this change, they don't establish a great enough sense of urgency. They don't let them know why it's so important they change, and we need to do this right away because the longer we wait, we're, we'll be in that inactive period that, that I just talked about. We have to change now. Um, you know, so we don't end up being a crisis. So you have to make sure that there's an urgency. You uh, have to create a powerful coalition. Get together the people who are natural leaders. Every group has a, a group of peers, has somebody who they tend to look up to and tends to be the person they trust to communicate things to. Find those people. Use them in the proper way. Uh, make, make sure that your your change doesn't lack a vision. That people know what what the expected outcome is and why we're doing this and we have a vision of where we want to be so that you can inspire them and motivate them to be a participant in the change. And then understand and communicate the vision by a factor of 10. I mean, under communicating is another mistake they make. you got to communicate. Communication is key to motivation, to understanding, uh, and to acceptance. So make sure you communicate. And make sure you renew, remove all obstacles. Anything that can prevent them from being successful or prevent them from changing. In the case of Yahoo, they're going to have to make sure they have offices for people, that they have some way of helping people find child care if they need it. If they've worked out of their home because and they haven't, don't have child care, and all of a sudden they have to find some, make sure that you're understanding about that and you help them in some way to, to overcome these obstacles. Um, you know, it, it might be uh, uh, parking problems. If you haven't had people, so many people there, make sure you have an ample parking, ample space for them. Uh, accommodate them in every way possible to make this transition work. Um, not systematically planning for and creating short-term wins. You have to have short-term goals, kind of like, you know, um, lead them with breadcrumbs, kind of to the to the new vision. You know, so have some goals and some incentives along the way. Don't declare victory too soon. Make sure that you are well entrenched in the new way of doing things and everyone understands it and everyone's marching that way before you declare victory. We've seen George Bush standing on the, uh, you know, on the flight deck of the aircraft carrier declaring victory and here we are, how many years later, still fighting these wars. Um, don't declare victory too soon. And not anchoring changes in the corporation's culture. Uh, these changes have to be all the way up the ladder. Everyone has to buy into it. Everyone has to be demonstrating it. Everyone has to be living it. Okay. Uh, changes, tools, and techniques. Many changes are results-driven change. Um, they supplant the emphasis on activity with focus on the quickly measuring and improving results. So, for example, for Yahoo, it'll quickly be trying to improve profitability. Um, that's, that would be a results-driven change. We have to become profitable again. We can't keep losing money, so we're going to keep our eye on the bottom line. And we'll be able to measure whether or not we're on the, we're in the right direction based on the results of our financials. Um, so that's one easy way of doing it, and you can do that with almost anything. Quality, if you want to improve quality of something, you can measure uh, the results of customer surveys, quality surveys. There's a lot of different ways of making results driven change, depending on what it is you want to do. Um, the General Electric Workout is just a real quick uh, model that many companies use where they do a three-day meeting or or a retreat, if you will, where they sit and they generate solutions to specific business problems. You bring together the key players, uh, some idea people, um, some management people, and you bounce around ideas. You give them time to engage each other, um, perhaps doing a leisure activity, such as playing golf together or, or sitting around uh, having a cocktail hour in the evening uh, in a meeting space. People let their hair down a little bit, be a little less formal, get the creative juices flowing. Or it can be very formal where you just put some problems up, list some problems, and what the hell are we going to do to fix these? And, you know, and give people free reign to generate ideas and try to stimulate some conversation. This is, the, uh, this is in the book, um, The General Steps for Organizational Development Intervention. Um, per, first of all, for the, there has to be a reason for change. Uh, you see some kind of a problem. Obviously, okay, so the, the problem is discovered, there's a need for change, that's the entry part of it. Um, and then you do the startup part where the change agent enters. For example, when Yahoo was going downhill, they realized there was a problem. That was the entry. When they started realizing they're losing market share, um, we can't continue doing things this way. 
they got rid of the old CEO, they brought in a new person who had kind of a track record for change, new ideas. That was the startup of it. And she got assessment and feedback. She kind of analyzed the company, talked to the main players, kind of looked at what was going on, and now they're doing some action planning. Um, uh, and she sat down with managers. What are some ways we can do this? One of them, obviously, was to let's get rid of telecommuting, bring everybody in, and see if we can increase productivity, share ideas, put everybody back together, um, and try to problem solve. And then the intervention. That's the action plan or what's actually happening. And then once this all happens, she'll give it a year or so, and then they'll look to see, did it work? Evaluate it. And if it, does, if it is working, then adapt it, adopt it permanently, change policies, keep moving forward in that direction, maybe make some incremental uh, shifts or adjustments, some, tweak some things, and then separation. She might move on to another company. Once she gets this one back up and running, she might train or groom an employee to take her place, or she might stay there for several years. You know, um, At Hardy's, we used to have uh, some managers that we called, they weren't called change agents, they were called turnaround experts. And we would take a, a manager who had that kind of a track record, and we put them in a store that was performing badly, um, losing money, things like that. We fire the old manager, we bring in this person to re-motivate people, to retrain people, to get the, the store back in uh, making money and back in good standing. He would groom a, a manager to replace him when he left, and then he would get everything, re you know, get this person trained the way he wants things done and the way things properly should probably be done, and they'd move on to another store. And they were called a turnaround expert. And we would, we have been probably five people like that in the company that would move around. Uh, they tended to be mostly um, uh, people who didn't have families, probably uh, single or divorced, who were willing to move uh, and move around and possibly have to relocate for a year or maybe two years at a time, mostly, most time about a year. Um, and then we're willing to move to another city again. So they, you, know, you didn't want them to have children they had to uproot. You didn't want them to have a spouse and then change jobs. So, so single people tend to be the best or older people who are, who, uh, uh, who are divorced possibly would be good candidates for this kind of stuff. Anyway. All right. And then the different kinds of organizations. And these are just show you different levels of it. Uh, large systems, such as Yahoo is going through a large system intervention where they are changing the entire company. Uh, there could be small group interventions where maybe a department needs to be changed or a process needs to be changed. Okay, where you would set a goal for a unit. Maybe you have a down division on the West Coast is not doing well, so you, you only tackle their, their problems. And then there's person intervention. Um, I've had uh, uh, in, in companies I've worked with, I've been sent to training before. Um, I've had peers that were sent to um, uh, uh, sensitivity training. Um, I've had, I had one person that I worked with, they had to go to anger management uh, classes, uh, how to control the temper and, and things like that. So those are single person interventions. You need to, you need to tackle that. You need to, we need to change you a little bit, move you a different direction kind of stuff. Okay, Holden Outerwear. This is a garment uh, design company. Um, please watch the video. It's, I think you'll find it pretty interesting and just kind of think about these questions as you're watching the video. Right? no test questions on this, but I think, hope you'll find it interesting. Thanks for watching. I hope uh, you found this uh, suitable um, a, a replacement to, to me live. Of course, you'll miss some of my witty jokes and bouncing things off me, but you know, when I do it this way, I don't get quite as off uh, off track and waste as much of your time as, uh, as like we sometimes do in class. But again, um, we're doing this because of lack of time, and thanks for watching. See you in class.